Uh, hi, welcome everybody. I'm Guy Stewart, VP of Engineering at uh, Fat Skunk. Um, Fat Skunk is an early stage uh, startup company. Um, I joined the company only recently. Uh, I'm presenting here today on behalf of uh, Marcus Jacobson, who, who couldn't make it. Um, you know, I joined Fat Skunk in order to work with some you know really smart people and uh, learn more about this this industry. Um, you know, as uh, VP of Engineering, I'm looking to grow the team and uh, uh, work with other smart people. Um, now, the the title of this is. Uh, you know why traditional the traditional AV paradigm is doomed. Um, it you know it doesn't necessarily mean that it's doomed completely. It still has a place. Uh, so so anybody who works at traditional AV companies, uh, please don't be offended by this title. There we go. So uh, threats. So you know we're, we are targeting a specific threat. Um, you know that the antivirus traditional antivirus software. Uh, it uses signature-based um, algorithms, uh, behavioral modeling uh, to identify threats. So it's, it's looking in the in the OS, in the host OS for you know spyware, trojans, um, and you know passive passive rootkits. You know these signature-based mechanisms and behavioral models require require a lot of scanning. You know consistent scanning uh, updates to the databases. Uh, the databases are often out of date. Uh, malware authors can just simply modify their malware, often using automated tools to make changes and test the changes to ensure that they bypass the signature databases or behavioral models of the, AV, the antivirus software. Right? And so all of this continuous scanning uh, of the AV software Updating of databases consumes network bandwidth and consumes CPU power on the devices. Uh, you know, everybody's familiar with their devices slowing down when their antivirus software is running, right? And on mobile devices, it's especially bad because it burns up battery power uh, and consumes network bandwidth. Now, what, you know, another threat is this, what I have at the bottom, the hypervisor active root kit, right? It's a little bit different than the a passive root kit. The, a passive root kit, uh, it may have root access, but uh, it's not able to hide um, under the operating system. The active root kit, the hypervisor based root kit, might take control of hardware and can hide effectively by running, you know, it's, what it's basically doing is it's running the host operating system and antivirus software uh, in a virtual machine, which means that, that the antivirus software um, can't detect that uh, that active rootkit, right? The active rootkit can hide, uh, maybe by using you know interrupts or page tables to move itself in and out of memory uh, where the uh, um, antivirus software cannot even see it. So you know, security you know, hardware security solutions um, are also employed, but you know they have they have some limitations. Um, the there's a security boundary between the host operating system and the secure hardware, right? So if you're familiar with security evaluations, you know like the FIPS 140, which talks about the security boundary. Um, if you breach that boundary. Uh, you've re you've increased the uh, the vulnerability of the uh, of the hardware, right? So, for example, uh, if you want the this uh, your secure hardware to actually look into or introspect the memory of the open platform, right? Well, that exposes it to uh, return oriented programming types of attacks, right? So it can you know the secure hardware now has visibility into the unsecure memory of the normal world, okay? So the antivirus software on a good day because of, you know, the ability of uh, the malware authors to modify their, their software, um, the outdated uh, uh, signature databases, on a good day they can detect about half of the malware that's out there.
So, and also, you know, the hardware is vulnerable to an unsecure supply chain, right? And I apologize for the image there, but it's, you know, most of the hardware that we use in the United States is uh, manufactured overseas. That uh, you know, the hardware is laid out at places like TSMC, right? The the chips are run through um, automated test equipment in Taiwan. Uh, the you know the phones and other devices are manufactured in in Taiwan or in China, uh, where they're you know susceptible to um, uh, you know to attacks not necessarily by governments or or companies but even by individual employees right so uh, and it's not just overseas but also in the U S so you know secure hardware no matter how secure you make it, it's vulnerable to a single individual in the supply chain deciding that he wants to break that, that secure supply chain. Okay, so what is Fat Skunk's approach? Uh, what we do is we take the physical attributes of a device, all right, we measure them, and we look for characteristics of the device that are, are uh, changed or touched by the, the presence of malware or by an active rootkit. So one mechanism that we use is this principle of displacement. So, you know, this is similar to what Archimedes found, right, in his little eureka moment, right? He said, well, you know, I can't tell if this is gold or not, but if I submerge it in water by displacement, I can tell you uh, what its uh, density is, and I can tell you whether or not it's, it's pure gold, right? And so we do very much the same thing with memory on the device. Now, you know, Archimedes' problem, it was actually a little bit more subtle than that, where he could not measure the displacement directly. He had to use uh, indirect uh, methods to measure the displacement. So he actually used buoyancy and submerged his scale uh, in a tub of water. Uh, and, you know, our problem is even a little bit more challenging. Uh, we have a lot of things moving around. There's noise in our environment that we have to compensate for. Uh, so what do we do? The, this is the uh, software space-time trade-off, right? So everybody knows, uh, is familiar with this, the more memory that you have, the faster your program can run, right? Um, so we have a microkernel that runs in main memory, right? And, and by the way, so most systems have this memory hierarchy. So here I'm showing cache and RAM. Everybody knows cache is faster than RAM, and RAM is faster than flash or secondary storage, right? So we can, uh, you know, we can look at how much cache that we have and use that as our, basically as our vessel uh, to measure the volume of, Right? And we're looking for the displacement caused by the presence of malware. Uh, the, if, now the, the red box there is malware. The blue box at the top, that's our microkernel that's running to actually measure the memory. All right? So that microkernel uh, looks at the cache, performs an operation that's sensitive to the amount of memory that it has available, right? and reports the results uh, to an external entity. Um, if there's malware present, it's going to displace some of the memory that's available to the microkernel, and it's going to slow down that process. Okay, and in this case, it'll cause uh, memory elements to be swapped between cache and RAM. Right, so we'll see cache evictions, and we'll see cache misses. Okay. So our approach. Okay, so the, the large gray box, uh, that represents uh, the faster memory. Um, in this case, it's a cache memory. Uh, inside of it, you see the black boxes. Those represent uh, honest software, data, or passive malware. Um, the blue box, again, is our microkernel, and the red box is uh, malware. Now, the, the malware over, overlaps our, our, our kernel, as you can see, and that's used, we use that to indicate that our kernel itself might be compromised. It might contain some malware, but we, de we detect that if that occurs. Okay. So our first step is to stop execution of all software, right, all the honest software. Um, that includes, you know, uh, passive malware, 
that, uh, or uh, passive root kits. And we do that by um, you know, a number of steps, including uh, turning off interrupts, for example. Uh, we eject it from, from cache or from main memory by flushing the cache, flushing the page tables, uh, depending on, on what level that we're doing the uh, attestation at. Right. So at this point, the only thing that should be in memory is our monolith kernel, our microkernel. The next step, we overwrite all of memory with a, a random seed, a random uh, pattern. Right? Uh, it's a, we use a seed that's received from an external entity and the external entity starts a timer saying, okay, I've given you the seed, you can now generate the random pattern and I'm timing you on this operation. Now if there's malware in place, it's going to be refused to be overwritten and it'll continue to occupy some, some portion of memory. The next step, once we've written that random pattern to memory, the next step is to receive another seed, another element, and we compute a key digest of all of memory, right? And the, uh, we use a, a pattern to access memory that's not known beforehand, right? So there are external entity, this, we call it the external verifier, um, you know, issues a new uh, seed to use to, in the key digest and the pattern used to access the access memory. So uh, malware um, cannot pre-compute these values, right? Uh, so we take that key digest and uh, the and issue that back to our external verifier. Okay, the external verifier again has kept track of the time that this takes. Okay, so uh, what could go wrong with this approach? First is a silent attack. Let's say that malware has taken control of the system and refuses to respond to a challenge to the external verifier. Well, another one is this uh, corrupted code attack, right? Uh, let's say a, a malware author goes in and makes modifications to our microkernel directly. Um, uh, another attack is the evil, what we call the evil twin attack, right? So somebody takes a copy of our microkernel, um, modifies that copy, and might leverage our, the valid copy of the microkernel to make calls into it to perform operations using a form of this return-oriented programming type of attack. The last one that I show here is this evil interrupt attack where um, the, the malware may force interrupts to remain enabled, uh, set up an interrupt to occur maybe on a timer or on uh, some uh, peripheral event uh, or maybe a page fault event and uh, that will occur, um, you know, that it, where it knows that that, uh, that attack will, uh, or that interrupt will occur sometime after the, uh, the digest, right, the secure digest has been computed, right? Okay, so the um, the solution to these, right? The, on the silent attack where the connection is refused, right? Of course, that's easily detected by the external verifier, right? So the refusal means that the device uh, possibly has been compromised, and so we blacklist the device or uh, refuse any services to the device, refuse any financial transactions. The corrupted code attack. Um, where the, the malware author has gone in and made a modification to our, um, uh, to our microkernel. Well, when we compute the digest, the secure digest, we include the microkernel uh, code in that digest. So if that microkernel has been modified, the digest will be incorrect and we'll detect that. Now, you know, malware might say, well, I'll modify the, the kernel and I will, uh, when it's time to compute those areas, the, the digest for those regions of the kernel, well, I'll put in the right, I'll plug in the correct values. Um, 
Well, that's going to take time. It means that the malware has to move data from someplace else, gather the data from other locations. That's going to take time, and it's going to affect the overall timing of the attestation process. And so, you know, they have a choice. Either they'll get an incorrect checksum or they'll increase the timing of the attestation, both of which are detected by the external verifier. Uh, the evil twin attack. Um, well, the evil twin attack is another copy of the, of the microkernel, maybe a reduced size, right? So it can, as it's computing the digest, it can use the original values of the microkernel. It doesn't have to replace it with, new, with uh, values from someplace else, but the twin alone occupies space and memory, right? And uh, causes uh, cache evictions or memory evictions, uh, page faults, and again slows down the timing of the attestation. Uh, let's see, the evil interrupt attack. Okay, this is uh, where I'm going to, uh, we, we have a mechanism to detect this as well. And in fact, there's a number of other attacks that uh, come into play. Um, and these attacks and the, uh, the way that they're addressed um, are laid out in the white paper that we have that's available, I believe, on the Black Hat website or soon will be. Okay, so what do, you, what do we do with all of this? All right, there's, um, there's several, uh, I think, are very interesting uh, applications of this type of technology. Um, this one is uh, not necessarily my favorite, but it's a very interesting uh, application where we set up a secure execution environment. So a rootkit um, on a device that has control of the, you know, may have complete control over the kernel and the hardware. It's talking directly to the processor, it's controlling the cache, RAM, it's controlling interrupts, all aspects of the hardware. Right? It's basically running uh, everything else inside of a, a tiny little virtual machine and uh, any software running in that environment uh, has no idea what's real and what's being falsified by uh, this rootkit. Right? So, so our job is to detect that threat first. If, and, you know, so the, the red question mark in the rootkit, is that active rootkit present or is it not present? So we run our attestation process. That attestation process tells us whether or not that rootkit, that active rootkit is present. If, it's, if we determine that the active rootkit is not present, then we, you know, that basically asserts the, that we have a root of trust, it asserts the integrity of this root of trust, right? And we can develop that into the secure execution environment. And so within that secure execution environment, even if it's running in an operating system, that's been compromised by other types of passive malware, you know, no matter what it is or how aggressive it is, uh, we, can, we can isolate ourselves and perform secure operations inside of that, that um, secure execution environment. And those operations can include things like, you know, scanning secondary memory, looking, you know, using traditional AV mechanisms to look for malware, right, that's, uh, uh, that's present on the system, okay? Um, we can perform other types of uh, uh, secure operations, you know, maybe opening a, a password vault or, um, you know, uh, establishing, uh, establishing a connection with an external server, maybe an SSL connection. Um, How am I on time? Six minutes. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through a, like a quick review of what I've talked about because I know I, you know, with only 25 minutes, it's, uh, uh, I know I kind of skipped through a lot of things very quickly. Um, okay, so uh, one thing I know I skipped through, what do we do first? We perform uh, characterization of a known good device. So, you know, we'll intercept this device at, at uh, manufacturing time uh, in cooperation with, for example, the OEM and uh, perform a detailed uh, characteriz characterization of the device um, for a variety of different physical attributes of the device. Uh, that information is then sent to our um, external verifier. Uh, 
Uh, it's associated with a device at a later point using a, a secure, uh, unique identity of each device. Um, that's used by the external verifier uh, to generate a challenge to the device uh, when the device is out in the field. Now that the challenge might be generated either on request by an application running on the device or if the device is attempting to perform um, a secure operation with an external entity that um, external entity can uh, send a request to our server to issue a, um, a challenge to that device. Okay. Um, the microkernel runs on the device uh, measuring uh, the, uh, the physical characteristics of the device and it's not just a memory. Um, this is a very complex problem so there are a, there's a large number of things that we measure besides memory. Okay. Um, now the one mechanism is that the external verifier can perform the uh, direct measurements, right? For example, timing measurements. But uh, if it's far away from the device, it may not uh, have the accuracy that require or it may require that the measurements take longer than are desired. So it can use a proxy that we move closer to the device, uh, could be on a, um, on a, a, a local relay station or it could be on a desktop connected to the device over a, a, a direct connection, USB cable. It could be in on another chip that's on the PCB of the device. Uh, it could be embedded in a secure hardware element uh, that's embedded on the SOC itself. Right? Um, the, the characteristics of that, of that proxy, I'll call it, um, you know, vary depending on what function it's performing, uh, but it can be used, for example, to perform the very um, uh, high resolution timing measurements of the device. And uh, using these techniques, by the way, we've been able to get these attestation times, uh, measurement times down into the sub milliseconds so that a user of a mobile device, for example, or of an always on, always connected device uh, is not even aware of the fact that we're performing the attestation. And uh, we're able to measure and differentiate these types of attacks um, in orders of magnitude difference between um, a non-compromised system and a compromised system. So I think maybe I'll leave it at that and uh, see if we have time for questions. Two minutes for questions. So. And, and by the way, um, I'm new to the company. Marcus uh, Jacobson couldn't be here. He's, I wish he was here to answer your questions, but I'll do the best I can. Yeah, I see the, okay, so the question was um, the, you know, between uh, signature databases and behavioral analysis versus doing this type of, of physics-based attestation, um, are they complementary? And uh, the answer is yes, I think they're very complementary. Um, where we can do ours on demand, uh, and, and in fact we can say, well, we're going to do this, um, this attestation on demand immediately before an operation is performed. But remember, it's opening a secure environment inside of an otherwise compromised system. And so we still have to go to those other techniques like behavioral modeling and signature databases to clean up the rest of the operating system. Now, you know, it's, it's possible that you could use this secure execution environment as a root of trust for booting an entire operating system, but we all know that even a secure booted operating system can be compromised. Okay. Um, well, one more. We have one more question here. So. Right, and um, you know, so the the techniques that, we're, that we are using, um, we still have to leverage the existing mechanisms that are put into the device by the chip vendors and the OEMs, right? So, um, you know, the mechanisms that are used today 
uh, to, to authenticate a device to a network are the same mechanisms that we use. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you.